The views expressed in this presentation are those of the hosts and guests and do not represent the views of any lodge, grand lodge, appended body, or any other person or persons whomsoever. I am my mother's savage daughter, the one who runs barefoot, cursing sharp stones. I am my mother's savage daughter, I will not cut my hair, I will not lower my voice. My mother's child is a savage, she looks for her Romans in the colors of stones, in the faces of cats, in the fall of feathers in the dancing of fire and the curve of old bones i am my mother's savage daughter the one who runs barefoot cursing sharp stones i am my mother's savage daughter i will not cut my hair i will not lower my voice my hello how are you good and yourself i'm great Good, good to hear. Um, I, I if you haven't seen me before, I'm Wes. So um, watched some of your podcasts. Oh, I did saw, you? I saw um, your group at the yeah at the tavern. Oh. It looked like you guys have a lot of fun. Yeah, sometimes we have a little too much fun. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> and we uh, we get in a little bit of trouble here and there for that. Gosh, just uh, what can you do? something new here. Um, so. Yeah. Hey, Brock. Oh, you did make uh, it home. Uh, right? yeah, 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 yeah. I was like, man, I'm just going to go home and do it from my house. It's like 15 <laughs> minutes from my work. So, okay. It's definitely a better spot. Um, no. You know, I know our language could be bad sometimes. So, I mean, <laughs> slip and <laughs> say something. No, no, no worries. But you're, oh, I love it. More, more professional than we are. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, that doesn't bother me at all. <laughs> all right. Welcome, everyone, to the At Refreshment Masonic Video Podcast. I'm your host, Wesley Reuter, along with Brock from the show and with our special guest, Kathleen Adelworth Foster, the author of Donnerail Court. I know you guys probably see me post about it here and there, but, well, we're bringing her to you, and hopefully you guys read the book. If not, do check it out. So, Kathleen, first off, thank you very much for coming on the show. I greatly appreciate it. I know we all do, even though most of us aren't here. So my first question right off the bat is, tell us a little bit about yourself, you, you and your career. I was going to say, Wes, we got we to gotta figure out a little bit of like, yeah. Who, who this person is. So uh, my name is Kathleen, and I uh, spent the past 25 years of my life as a journalist traveling all over the world. Uh, I was a field producer, so I spent a lot of time in Iraq, Afghanistan. Uh, I know I'd, people are always surprised to see me. I'm like this little five foot tall blonde thing, but then I'm like, ah, hey, yeah, you know, I've dodged katushas in Israel and ridden in tanks in Iraq, and people are like, what, what, who is this chick? So, but that's me. I um, spent 25 years at Fox News, and while I was working full time, I was researching and writing this book about the Lady Freemason. Uh, it is my first uh, book of historical fiction. So it was a real stretch for me to go from years and years of nothing but nonfiction to easing my way into historical fiction for the first time. So I needed a lot of help from editors who I gladly paid. And I'm pretty happy with the book that I've produced. I self, I self, uh, self published it. So now I'm just getting it out there in the world. You know, I I wondered for years why I was spending so much time researching this woman who lived 300 years ago, getting going down the rabbit hole of Freemasonry. Like I know you guys understand it. It's never ending. I had to oh, yeah. back quite a few times to stay on track. Uh, but I kept saying to my husband, I just need to get this out in the world. I just need to get this out in the world. And that is what I've done. When did you first hear about this story? So, I know for us, when we joined Freemason, at least at least for me, it was within the first couple of weeks or months. Absolutely. Right. Everybody talks about it. And it's kind of one of those things where most Mason's wives kind of say like, oh, well, you know, I've heard a thing or two through the through the room or heard my husband reading books or some wives have even helped their husbands with their ritual work. So I uh, believe depending it. on what state you're in. So um yeah it's it's something that we we definitely hear about all the time which it's pretty interesting a woman in a male fraternity 
But tell me the version of the story that you first heard. Yeah, the first one I heard would probably be back when I was like reading about Madame Blavatsky. She was like a Russian lady who um, had a grandfather who was a very knowledgeable Freemason. And she read his books in his library and things like that and kind of decided she wanted to do that and kind of tried to infiltrate her way into into the order. But the the specific story I've heard is um, the the wife or the the girlfriend who was in the house who uh hid out in like a closet and then and listened in through the whole meeting you know just to try to believe what what kind of crazy stuff her husband was getting into but uh to do the historical research and see that it was actually like a daughter and like this whole thing is pretty wild and there's a lot of uh, various stories out there uh wesley what was the story that you heard um uh presented to me as this you know there was one female freemason right really well how did that happen well she was cleaning up some stuff and saw some things she shouldn't and then just decided to make her mason oh right. okay and i me i had no idea if this is true to me it was it was just a story it might be allegorical just like our masonic ritual mm-hmm. so throughout the years it's uh turned into a clock that she was in and your book <laughs> mentions that and the other not a brick wall but she was uh peeping through the cracks in the wooden wall is yeah. how it's told yes me. i would love to go to the powerpoint presentation that i have yes if, yes if by you all guys means. don't yeah, mind do. because it really it, it goes through how i came across this story and it really starts with my birth all right you see it full screen right yes absolutely perfect Okay. I tried to make this PowerPoint presentation look kind of like a family photo album because that's really what it's been for me. So let's start at the beginning. We have Elizabeth Howard St. Ledger Aldworth. So you'll notice that uh, we share a common name here. But the misinformation begins with her birth. She was either born in 1692, 1693, 1695, or she could have died anywhere between 1772 and 1775. For the purposes of my book and for possible future books, I went with the last, 1695 to 1775. There's also some dates about her uh, parents' marriage and how many siblings she has where that time frame makes the most sense. Okay, so Aldworth is my great-grandmother's maiden name. That's her. So she's Kathleen Aldworth. She was, um, well, I'm sorry. Well, first, there's me. That's me on the left, my great-grandmother. I was named directly after her. So Aldworth was her maiden name, but it was given to me as my middle name. So she was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and she her ancestors were members of Christ Church. Christ Church is pretty interesting because that's where uh, Benjamin Franklin was a member, and also Betsy Ross. They weren't there then, though. They were there, you know, about fifty years later in uh, the early eighteen hundreds. No, Christ Church Church was that uh, Protestant. Protestant. Okay. That is a Protestant church. It's actually super interesting too because there's a baptismal font in that church that was William Penn's, and he brought it over from England. So my ancestors were baptized in the same baptismal font as William Penn. Oh, wow. That's so, uh, that's right. Cool. Really cool. So yeah, I'm a Philadelphia girl, born and bred. I live, I've lived in New York for years. I live in New Jersey now, but you can never take the Philly. <laughs> no, and that's fitting too with uh, Freemasonry pretty in America starting in, in yeah. Philadelphia. That That's perfect. Yes. So it, wait till you see what mysteries I, I solved during the course of this research. So one of the things that my great grandmother told us uh, was that Anne Aldworth signed the Declaration of Independence. Well, when I was in high school, I was old enough to take a look and see, you know, oh, OK, let's take a look at some of these signers. And there was no Aldworth on it. So her sons even were like, oh, she didn't know what she was talking about. I talked to everybody I could possibly talk to. No one could tell me who this Aldworth was. So I just kind of stuck it in my back pocket until I finally figured it out during the course of my research about the Lady Freemason. Was it lemon juice, eyeglasses in the back of Independence? <laughs> the of Independence? I love that movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a favorite of mine. I'm pretty sure most Freemasons love it too. I haven't heard anybody talk bad about it. So. No, it's really fun. 
So the first time I ever heard about this lady Freemason was when I went to the pyramids at Giza for Y2K 2000. So it was um, 1999 and I really wanted to go to uh, Jerusalem for Christmas and I wanted to be at the pyramids of, of, at Giza for New Year's Eve, the Y2K turn of the millennium. No one would go with me. So I went by myself. And while I was there, I met someone i don't know if he was a freemason or wanting to become a freemason his name was mark he was british and he was there studying freemasonry's ties to egypt and all the different symbolism involved in it and when he found out that i had this aldworth name he said well did you know that there was one lady freemason named elizabeth aldworth no wow that's super cool but you know it was the year 2000 there wasn't really anything on the internet yet so another thing I just put in my back pocket for just a little while. So from there, I spent many, 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 many years on the road. You know, the green pants there, I'm in Haiti covering an earthquake. I went to Africa with Jesse Jackson. I met Bill Clinton in Haiti as well. And this uh, helicopter shot was from Iraq. So I had quite an interesting career. And in 2006, I was sent to cover a uh, a war between Hezbollah guerrillas and Israel. So I spent three weeks in August, 2006 in that little peninsula of land at the top of Israel that kind of juts into Lebanon called Kiryat Shimona. And I had to unfortunately tell my bosses that I had to leave my post and go to Ireland because my grandmother had died, left us a little bit of money and asked us to go on this genealogy trip to Ireland. So I left my job and went on vacation with my family. And when we got there, well, first let me show you this. So this is who I was supposed to be researching. This is my great grand, my great grandfather, Frank Canan. He was an early IRB, Irish Republican Brotherhood, which became the IRA. Uh, word is the legend in our family was that he'd killed 18 Englishmen as a volunteer in a flying column in Roscommon and the tans burned down his house. So he spent years on the run, hiding in people's chimneys, hiding in people's basements. And then when the civil war broke out in Ireland, he just couldn't fight Irish on Irish and he left. And that's why this branch of the family is in Philadelphia. So this is a different one. So when I landed, um, I, I had one quiet day in Israel before I left to go visit my family. And during that one quiet day, instead of punching in my Canaan family relatives, I, I put in Elizabeth Aldworth. I still can't really explain why I decided to look her up, but I did. And that's when I found out she was from County Cork. It's like the internet had caught up with her story. And I, I assumed that she was British. Aldworth is a British name but it turned out that she was from County Cork. So I landed at Shannon Airport, was meeting up with my dad and I said, hey, you remember that that Aldworth woman I told you about who was the first lady Freemason? Well, it turns out she's from County Cork. And this guy that my dad had hired to drive us around in a much too big bus said, well, yeah, not only that, but her house is still standing, do you wanna go? And we left from Shannon Airport and went straight to this house, Donnerill Court. That is the place where this whole story takes place. Nice. Um, I have to ask because all the photos I've seen on the internet and in your book didn't have the, the fence and the windows uh, boarded out. What, yep. what happened here? So that's what it looked like for a number of years. The last uh, St. Ledger, which was Elizabeth's family name, to live there was in 1969. In 69, everything was... Um, auctioned off. That's a whole long story I'm not even going to get into. Uh, then the Georgian Society owned it for a while, put in a bunch of effort, a bunch of renovation work. And then the um, the state of Ireland now owns it. The Office of Public Works owns it. But for a number of years, this is what it looked like when it was just kind of in between hands and in between enough money to renovate it. So this is what I saw the first time I went there. And it was at that chain link fence that the bus driver told me the whole story of the lady freemason okay uh i don't know much about ireland or anything and one of the first things i i came across in your book uh she was called the uh cork lady a cork woman yeah cork, cork yeah. woman okay mm -hmm. and me being the idiot i am i'm like the royal order of corks were around that oh, no, i don't know if you've heard of that it's a masonic thing but i'm like this oh, can't be right and i'm like well maybe it is and then i'm like okay yeah you're an idiot 
<laughs> yeah, she was just from County Cork, but it wasn't necessarily County Cork at the time. It was Munster Plantation, just like we had plantations here in the States. They had, plant, you know, the English just got around and colonized everything and had plantations all over the place. So this was, she was part of Munster Plantation. She lived, at, her Donna Rail estate was part of Munster uh, Plantation. So here's the story. Um, let me just see if I can move this. Uh, so sometime between 1710 and 1712, Elizabeth St. Ledger hid in the library at Goneril Court when her father and other Freemasons gathered there for one of their secret meetings. The popular story says the ceremonies were well underway before Elizabeth realized that her curiosity had placed her in serious trouble. As she attempted to quietly leave the room, her presence was discovered. The Freemasons were faced with a difficult choice, kill her to preserve their secrets or make her a Freemason. After long deliberation, the members decided to admit her as a member, thereby making her the First Lady Freemason. So this is from a sign that I didn't see on my last trip there, but this is a picture I took my first trip there. So, and this is the same story that the bus driver told me. So I was left with many, many questions. What do you mean? Her father was there, her brothers were there. Who saved her? Why did they want to kill her? What was the ritual like? You know, I knew, um, a little bit more about Freemasonry at that time because the guy I told you about at the pyramids, he sent me the Hiram key right after our meeting. So I read that cover to cover and was pretty interested in Freemasonry, but didn't know as much as, you know, I know today. Okay. As a journalist and all the research that you do, what did you think about the Hiram key? Well, I liked it because it was my first. Okay. It, I had no prior knowledge really other than some history channel you know documentaries i really liked it but i know that there's a lot of debate out there uh, about it uh, and <laughs> yeah it, it was one of my first masonic reads and at first it was pretty interesting but uh me being the way i am i'm like man this doesn't seem right where are the footnotes I'm like, yeah. I don't see footnotes you know it's, it's, it's all speculation which is fine but he presents it as you know hey this is accurate. Uh, and but... so that's what I that's what I encountered in my research about her and felt that there was no way I could write a book that could be classified as nonfiction after all the research I did. But I, I understand I, I, I get different um, comments about that book every everywhere I go. But right. Christopher it's not like it wasn't well written, but you know, it's the research for the truth yeah. wasn't accurate. Right. Well, you guys would know more than me. I'm not a Freemason. I only know what I can get my hands on and where I'm, which way I'm pointed. I can tell oh. you, which is surprisingly almost all of it <laughs> is out there. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. You could find that all on the internet. What uh, there was a couple things in that book. I'm just like, all right. Yeah. I don't believe this was um, the thing that the God of our fathers and me being as religious as I was at the time. I, and my research, I never heard that before in my life. And then they're like, oh, we found a mummy with the uh, uh, no crack open. What I'm about like, the mummy? What about the uh, mummy at Alexander? Yeah, I'm like, where's the mummy? Where, Where's the uh, reference for all this? Alexandria. Where did you find it? None of it was there. So. Live, well, right? Alexandria is where it's supposed to be, that mummy, right? Supposedly. But, it, you know, looking for like footnotes and trying to, you know, research it as much as I know how to. I couldn't find anything to make it seem that it was, you know, historically accurate or they actually did make this discovery. So I so don't it know. Sounds like you would have done the same thing I did after <laughs> going through what I went through to find the truth of this story, because the biggest question was, you know, who, what, when, where, why, and what did that, what did that ritual look like in 1712? So 1712 itself is proof that Freemasonry was operating in private homes in Ireland prior to the grand the creation of any grand lodges, right? So 1717 in, in England, 1726 in Munster, that was before even the Grand Lodge of Ireland was mm -hmm. created. That was 1730. So they're about to celebrate their 300th anniversary of the Grand Lodge of Munster, which I'll be going back for that. Oh, nice. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, that would be a, <laughs> that's a fun festivity. When our 300 came up, uh... I know a lot of guys did a the, the George Washington Memorial. They had a big ceremony there. It was really cool. It looked. Wasn't that? Oh no, the um, I'm thinking. It was, of yeah, it was for the. Um, it was a couple of years back. 
Well, one of the fun things that I, I found on eBay was this um, 1969, this book, The Entire Library of Donna Rill Court. I went through this book and highlighted every book I could find that would have been printed before 1712 and could have possibly been in the library at the time. So every book that is noted in my book was actually there at the time. Amazing. It was Great fun. research. Yeah, that's awesome. It's fun. And then there was all the crap I found on the internet. So this is where it got really fun. So this is something that we did <laughs> not happen. She did not fall bare ass through a ceiling. At <laughs> no, I did not hear that one. That's great, though. But yeah, this, that is absolutely hilarious. But this is super interesting, too. So this is part of an exhibit at the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And this, it says here, this version was printed in Philadelphia, but it's based on a 1754 print from London. And it's inspired by Elizabeth St. Ledger. But so 1754, she was still alive. And it was only a few decades after she'd become a Freemason. So story, her story got out pretty quickly. Now, would this, uh, would that uh, cartoon or newspaper make it to Donna Rail, which I'm assuming she's, she was there at the time. She was there at the time. I, I don't know. There were a series of, reports made in Dublin newspapers, and she was a, a, a subscriber to a couple of Masonic only um, publications, but that, I'll get into that a little bit. All right. This is something that uh, I, I loved this. So the only, this is Ripley's Believe It or Not, the only female Freemason, Elizabeth Aldworth, daughter of the Viscount Donorail, concealed herself in a large grandfather's clock and heard the Masons at an initiation meeting. They wanted to kill her, but she was too good looking. So they gave her the first two degrees of masonry. So interesting, right? So we know her dad yeah, was there. We hear it. this grandfather clock, first two degrees, which I'm told was the only, they only had two degrees at this time. Correct. Yes. Um, it's not known, I, I would think, amongst a lot of Freemasons, because it's always speculated there's always been three degrees, but there it was a two degree system and um well, you probably already know from your research, Hiram had nothing to do with it. Right, right. It, it, it changed in later. between 1717 and 1735 or something like that. They completely re rewrote the degree system. They had the two degree system from 1717. And then for whatever reason, the three grand masters, like, oh, we need a third one. So. Yep. So that's why I think I'm going to have to write a couple more books to because Freemasonry truly evolved over the course of her lifetime. And what makes her so interesting is that she didn't just go through this emergency initiation. She remained an active Freemason until her death. So she would have seen and gone through all of those changes. And this is great too. So this grandfather clock thing may have actually been perpetuated by James Joyce. So there was a woman, this is from Ulysses, Nosy Flynn, and she hid herself in a clock to find out what they what she do be doing. But be damned, they smelt her out and they swore in on the spot, a master mason. That was one of the St. Ledgers of Donorail. So apparently his father was a corkman and may have told him this story. Huh. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's cool how there's these, all these little threads where it's pulled through. And even when I was doing a little research before the show, it's kind of hard to find stuff that's not yours or other information out there. Right? I couldn't believe no one beat me to this, writing this as in this form in 300 years. So this is this is one of my favorites. So I found this quote from Universal Co-Masonry, which as you guys know is for men and women. And the first lodge uh, in France was actually named after her. So here we have a quote attributed to her and it says, every move you make starts with your heart and that's in rhythm or you're in trouble. And I'm like, that just doesn't sound like a woman from the 18th century. So I asked uh, the people in Ireland, I asked everybody, have you ever heard this quote? This is here, this is here. No, no, no. Because I'd never heard any real quote from her at this time when I was in the middle of my research. So I kept digging and here's what I found. There was a line cut off at the top and no wonder it didn't sound like her because it was Sugar Ray Robinson. Sugar Ray Robinson. <laughs> <laughs> That's everything in boxing. 
Yes. Every movie you make starts with your heart and that's in rhythm where you're in trouble. Suddenly we have something that makes sense, right? Wow. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about, oops, let's talk about what primary sources I did have to work with, which had been trusted throughout the years. So the first thing that was ever published about her was in 1811, and it was a pamphlet along with this mezzotint, which is pretty famous and it's out there. And it was produced in court by her descendants. It's called the memoir of the life of the Honorable Mrs. Aldworth, the only female who ever obtained the honor of initiation in the sublime mysteries of Freemasonry. So this first came out in 1811 and it was reprinted in 1871. This is something you can find on Google Books. It's out there. Oh. Yeah. But this is where I found the most interesting information. In 1895, the AQC, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it, uh, supplied a few supplements to that original 1811 and one of them um well both of them actually are described by one of her descendants the sixth viscount who was somebody who was living in london and who brought the donneril lodge i'm not sure if you guys know that there is one in london brought that over to london from uh donneril from where it had been ongoing after, and since her initiation more it did eventually become its own lodge, but um, he referred to this as the most accurate. And the reason why I know this is because I bought uh, a copy of the 1914 memoir of the Lady Freemason, and inside was the letters from the sixth Viscount to the man who was collecting all of the information. Here we go. That's the book I bought on eBay, and inside were these letters. It was crazy luck. So here it says um, it, the year 1712 and some repairs or alterations were being made to the wall in the room in which the lodge was being held. And that is what enabled Elizabeth St. Ledger, the Viscount's daughter, to remain hidden from a spectator in the adjoining room of the proceedings up to a certain point when she became frightened and attempted to escape. So there are other versions of this story where she would have had to tiptoe through the room. Have you heard that one? That she was in an alcove in the room or behind a curtain? No, no, no. Okay. Yeah. So she's now this will make sense. She succeeded in leaving the room unobserved and was captured by the Tyler outside the door. And after consultation, she was given the alternative of being put to death or go through the ceremony and in initiation. So of course she chose the latter, became a Mason, and later was known to walk at the head of Freemasons in Cork whenever they had a public procession. Apparently she was in full regalia at these times. And Richard Aldworth, who afterwards became her husband, is supposed to have been there at the lodge at the time. And then here's where he says that the most account of all of these things are in the AQC. And I'm going to get into what else was in there as we go along. So this, um, this memoir of the Lady Freemason, the first edition was in 1914. And the most recent one, I highly recommend uh, you get a copy of this. It was edited by David Butler, who was also the proofreader and editor of my book wonderful guy. And if you know Karen Kidd, she's written about many other female Freemasons and she has a fantastic chapter all about the Lady Freemason in there. Wow, interesting. No, I haven't heard uh, of either one of those books. Huh. The This one I think is out of print. They're working on getting it uh, back on um, either an ebook frame or e ebook form or in printed form. I'm actually, I'm actually really pushing them to do this because it's their 300 is coming up. And right now they're selling my book and my book is all of the proceeds or all of the profits are being donated to them because they need an, uh, they need to put about a million euros worth of work into their building. And one of the things that they will be using the money for is a new exhibit space for all of the items they have from her life. But you'll also see more of it just a moment. Wow, that is that is so kind of you. Wow, thank you very much. Yeah, Not my great. lodge, but thank you. Uh, you know, for the fraternity. That that's amazing. Well, um, we I don't you know I do this lecture all over the world really, and I don't charge for it because it's not the masonic thing to do and when i spent all this time in ireland i donated proceeds uh, into at two different events to uh, three different charities because i felt like it was something that she would have done and actually i have another quote in here coming up as how she felt about philanthropy and how it's really affected me i mean a lot of you guys i mean i just think you guys are great and i learned i've learned so many lessons that i use in my life every day just from the research i've I've done and the events I've gone to and the people I've met. So 
I think you well, well, thank you. I'm I'm sure <laughs> a lot of us need those lessons. I know I'm one of them. So <laughs> I mean, that's the whole point, right? Yeah. So what do we know about her early life? So we know that her father was Arthur St. Ledger. He was the first Viscount of Donorail. So he was an English landowner who was given land. Well, his family was given land in Ireland. So he is of Anglo-Irish, um, Anglo-Irish family of Nor Norman descent. And he was known to be an ardent Mason. Uh, I have some evidence that she may have been called Betty. And she was the fifth child and second daughter, actually, of, of Arthur and his wife, Elizabeth. She is usually referred to as the only daughter, but that's not true. And I know this because there's a little church across the street from where Donnerill Court is. And there, there is this um, shrine and on it, it says that the Viscount had three sons and two daughters. So there was a Mary who died young and she is not listed on any pedigrees or anywhere. So I kind of gave her a story in the book. So, uh, yeah, I was gonna just going to say, is that story folklore or? That is one. So, I, will, I would love to talk to you guys about what's true and what's not in my book. And that is one of the things I made up, but it was based on the the real yew tree, which you will find all over Ireland. And those, those berries are highly, highly poisonous. I have a daughter named Mary. I have twin daughters. And I almost didn't name her Mary because I'd already written that chapter. <laughs> and I was a little afraid of She's named after my husband's grandmother. And my I have the other daughter is Elizabeth. She's named after my grandmother. So... I went with it, but she thinks it's funny. I'm glad she isn't freaked out by it. Good, good. So this is, um, if you ever go to Donrell, this is what Donrell looked like at the time in around the 1720s. And right there in the middle is the, where it says church is where that, the church I was just talking about. And the house is actually right below. You can't see it. Yeah, okay. I, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's, I know. I wish it's. I'm just getting old. <laughs> okay so now let's talk about her initiation this is a portrait of her that hangs in the grand lodge of of uh ireland in dublin and it just has a little plaque below it that says mrs aldworth and this is kind of how i how i pictured her in the book kind of voluptuous kind of mysterious kind of uh too curious for her own good yeah she has the um uh... The curious eyes, like, are you really doing what I think you're doing? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's interesting. So this is from the first version of the Lady Freemason, the memoir of the Lady Freemason, and it actually was part of the book. It's still part of the book, but we know now that it's this is incorrect. So this set, you can see the little um, uh, square and compass on the front wall. It says it's marking the lodge room not true that's the library where we were the other day mm. it's the this is completely incorrect and there's a lot of reasons to uh prove this wrong i'm going to show you the house at the time didn't have those bows on the side this is what the house looked like in the 1700s so the library is in the front you can see here it says the portion of the wall under repair so she would have been i had to make up that story but it made sense that the lodge room would have needed more security and maybe soundproofing than, than less. So there are stories that they were making an arch. I can't imagine they were making an arch between the two of these rooms. I imagine that they were probably walling up a door or walling up some kind of arch and maybe did it a little haphazardly and maybe the mortar wasn't in there yet. There had to have been a way for her to be able to actually prick a, prick a brick through the wall, which is the story but it does make sense this story that the tyler would have been in the hall right yeah um hey, can you go back to that real quick yeah it, i know everyone loves this because <laughs> i'm just going at least here in illinois how everything's situated um it looks like um where the library is there's two uh what looks like to be pillars that may have been where there could have been an archway that's exactly but like but for us there were there would be two doorways on the bottom, one the preparation room and the other the Tyler's room. Oh, if, we'll have if to get this into is that. The, depending on how it's situated, um the the lodge for, for the ritual. Well yeah, I wonder how they prepped the candidate back then. Right. If, if it was the same as or if they had it like in another bedroom, maybe, or if the candidate was prepped like you know how some uh lodges will the, the candidates prepped beforehand and arrives 
you know, you hear of old Masonic stories where, you know, a wagon would come pick up a guy at night and they'd get him ready in the wagon on the way to the lodge. And then he'd pull up and he'd already be blindfolded and ready to go to the degree right at the gates of the lodge, you know? Right. right. We forget that just because it is this way now doesn't mean there hasn't been changes to our ritual. It doesn't change like much though, Wax, so we all know that. <laughs> yeah, so well, this just... may have been what it looked like at her time. Remember, who knows what it really looked like at her time? Right. There were alterations to that lodge room that are exactly as you're describing. I'm going to show it you. Would, it would be crazy, though, to be hiding in the wall and see your your dad and all these people doing a mysterious ritual that you don't know what it is. And for her to be frightened enough to be like, oh, I got to I know I shouldn't be seeing this. Right. It's just so unreal to think and how we always talk about, uh, you know, now there's social media movies and stuff like but like that was the experience going through these degrees, ceremonies and rituals and rites. That was like something that made these people in, informed and changed them, bonded with people because it was like the thing to do. Mm -hmm. And they came from far and wide on nights of the full moon, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um. Uh, there was another question I had. I did they actually meet on a full moon or that's, did... the, that's the story I've heard. Yes. Okay. That it was a night of a full moon. So I looked up what date could have been. Oh, that's cool. Nice. A full moon in November 13th. It's a little complicated though, because the, the calendar changed since 1712, but I just went with what I could find. Another reason why I had to go with historical fiction. I knew that she had got, she married Richard five months after her initiation, which so that would have made her initiation in November. And then I went back to try to figure out when in when the, when there would have been a full moon in the month of November in, 20, in 1713. Oh, wow. Nice. Sorry, 1712. Yeah. So I had a lot of questions. So I um, decided to go back to Donnerell. I contacted the Office of Public Works, which is the uh, Irish organization that owns several pop properties, historic heritage properties across the whole island of Ireland, and I went back. So here I am, I got a tour of the house, I got a tour of the grounds, they gave me about a week to come and go, they let me sit in there and kind of imagine what, what the house would have looked like at the time, the smells, you know, the what the gardens would have looked like, and I made a lot of really good friends there in the town who gave me all of their stories and I pretty much used everything I could get from the people on the ground in the book. And they gave you full access to the building? Yeah, isn't that amazing? That's and I'll awesome. show you what it looked like at the time. And you're gonna also see. So the house was massively expanded over the years. So you saw what it would have looked like just, so it would have been, I know you can't, in person it's a lot easier. I can use my pointer, but you look <laughs> at this, look at this, they call this study see what they call the study here and see there's an extra room yes just like what you guys were describing so i imagine that was the candidate's room yeah yeah, that that's could, we can yeah. so here's uh the library and what it looked like when i was there the first time so i imagine that there might have been uh, some window seats that she might have fallen asleep at and that's why I, I had to create a reason for her to look out the window be there if you read the book, this will all make sense. A uh, quick question. I uh, noticed the room is green. Uh, and I know Scotland, their aprons and regalia are green. How is it in Ireland? Uh, it's it's like a baby blue. Is it okay. Actually, the original, the original color of Ireland was a royal blue. So if you have the book, there's a, a royal blue uh, banner on the bottom of the book. That yes. was the original color of Ireland. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yep. Huh. And I know this because an Irish Freemason designed my book, the interior and the cover. Oh, very cool. They were very involved for, in every aspect of this. But so this is the one of the, this is that alcove that you saw on the other um, floor plan. And you can see on the floor that the boards, the floorboards are different because they were built at different times. These bows went on in 1805. 1805. So yeah. she couldn't, that, you got to throw out that version of the story that that could have been the library in that bow or that could have been an alcove where she hid behind a, a curtain because that, that that whole room there didn't exist during her time. Okay. 1712. It was built on after, after her death. 
So this would have been where I believe there was some sort of doorway or uh, archway that would have been blocked up. Now what's on the other side? Ready? Remember this? Ooh. Oh, geez, I, I changed things. All right, well, this is what's on the other side. It's a panel. It's a fully wooden paneled room huh. with what I believe is a compass with the directions on the ceiling. Show you some. Yeah. Huh. Mm -hmm. There's the, there's the little room. So in that first 1712 floor plan, that wall wasn't there. The, the fireplace wasn't there, but if this room was continually used as a lodge room in the years after her initiation, it looks like they made some other changes to better adapt it to. Yeah, that more looks that looks a little bit more like a preparation room. Mm -hmm. How cool! Yeah, so I'm just going to go back to this other slide. So this is one of the things that I was trying to figure out. You know what that ritual might have looked like in that room at the time. So we already discussed 1712, the two degrees. What what did it mean at the time? Was it two separate rituals? Was it one you know, two in one? Did the second degree mean a master mason? Because some people have said, you know, she was made a master mason on the spot. What did that mean? So I started looking through you know, these manuscripts for, that all predate 1712 and realized that I was just going way too far, going much farther than I needed to. I mean, I'm sure you've read some of these where they're, they're really more about the stonemasons, you know, frightening him with a thousand different grimaces you know things like that that just i couldn't see being part of this particular ritual so this is the point where i decided there had to be historical fiction and i wanted to give people something that they might actually recognize at least a little so i took what i could find in basically it's the monitor for the grand lodge of ireland changed a bunch of it so that i wouldn't get in trouble <laughs> but <laughs> essentially i think i've heard that i still went too far with it i've gotten a little bit of a that's record. okay I, yeah i was gonna ask you some it's questions i'm like wow did uh, <laughs> did you just do it did they say okay or oh no oh it, no they were they <laughs> i was giving chapters of this book to 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 david butler who was the guy the he's the the grand archivist and librarian for monster freemasonry and he um was reading it to his brothers and I would do Zooms like this. Mm -hmm. And there were quite a few things that I was worried about that we we discussed and they had me change a couple of things to protect the innocent. <laughs> <laughs> and and they and they really kept me from making a fool of myself too. Yeah, well that's good. That's always yeah. good. <laughs> All right. So then we, you know, had to look at who who was present that night. So it turns out it was the initiation of a neighbor, James Coppinger, who lived, the, and the Coppinger family did live about a mile east of Donnerill and Castle Saffron. So that part I could get in there. Arundel Hill, is, if you've read the book, is one of the characters, and he is um, he was a neighbor, and he he actually talked to his sons quite a bit about being in lodge with her in the years preceding. So I think for my next book, if I ever get there, I'm a little overwhelmed at the moment. But what would it be like when she shows up at her first, at the first lodge meeting after her initiation? Did they think she was actually going to be there? We'll have to find out. So her father, her brothers, the butler whose name I couldn't find. So I made up a story for him. Uh, Richard Aldworth, the man she ended up marrying. And Isaac Rothery, which is interesting. I worked him in because he is the same architect who did the renovation of Donna Rail Court in the 1720s and also built the home that she and Richard lived in together. Yeah, I was going to ask you about most of those people, <laughs> you know, who is uh, historical fiction, who is, you know, real. So you answered pretty much all. There of it is. <laughs> you can really the only person, the only two really are, are the butler and Isaac that I don't know. But okay. so the butler, the, the daughter, Rihanna. Yeah, from completely fictional. OK. And the reason why I made that whole Barbados story up is because I went on vacation in Barbados while my husband was at the beach. I spent the entire time in the historical society looking up the Aldworths and their plantations there and what kind of slaves they had there. And that whole community of 
red legs, the Irish red legs, they're still there. And I actually met one while I was there. I couldn't believe it. there he was like redheaded guy with a full brogue who had never spent a day of his life outside Barbados. Oh, wow. Yeah. I looked that up. Uh, the Cromwell sending everyone over to Barbados and they're killing every 10th uh, Irish man just for the hell of it. And children. Oh, yeah. yeah. It, 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 yeah. It didn't matter. It, they said, well, you said soldier in it, or no, what I read said soldier, but I did read that the women and children were killed. I don't yeah, know. children so, were killed. Just- I heard the Cromwell, and I thought of that, uh, the Hocus Pocus movie, the Cromwell witch with the, she's got red hair and everything, and she's out to kill the children. I'm like, oh my God, is that a connection here that I didn't even notice? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> there, I mean, there are different, I mean, the the Cromwell era started around the Puritan era. So there was a group of, well, I'm going to get into that too. There was a group of Puritans that went to Ireland in 1620, the same year as the Mayflower. Okay. I can't, I'm getting ahead of myself. But I keep going. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So here's one of the um, pieces of proof, you know, proof from 1935 in a South Carolina newspaper. But this is one of the places where I saw, I'm just going to read the bottom, that the girl was sentenced to die, but one of the men falling in love with her beauty saved her by proposing that she take the oath. And she later married her savior, Richard Aldorf of Newmarket County Cork. So there he is. There's old Richard. This is a portrait I got from uh, one of their descendants who now lives in England. This portrait and another one you're about to see were actually saved from Newmarket Court in the 1920s when the family had to go back to England for that version of the Troubles, right? <laughs> I love this. The Aldworth coat of arms motto is um, neither, hold on, have it right um, neither rashly or timidly or not to neither fear nor be timid, which I, I think really kind of explains her whole movement in it. You know, she's she was kind of rash, but not timid, not fearful. I just like, now, yeah. was that the fi- family motto before then, they were married? Yes, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Even more interesting. <laughs> I know. I just thought that was cool, so I threw that in there. So this is one of the things that made the AQC... Um, one of the most reliable they couldn't find the marriage license of elizabeth and richard for a long time because it was filed in the wrong place which happens a lot in ireland so this is her actual marriage license that shows uh, the date of april 1713 when they got married you can see her signature and this is the house that was built after their marriage and how far was that from down a rail court it's it's not that far i want to say it's like a half an hour but now today i don't know how long it would have taken them at that point yeah probably a couple hours on horse and buggy or (laughs) he had a long day a long day that day so it's an interesting building it's kind of a u-shaped building and they have a beautiful oval staircase inside so i think that oval staircase needs to come into play in a in a future book when fellow craft comes in. So the, another funny thing happened, they've got all this long string, string of coincidences that kept happening to me as I was doing this research. I went to Newmarket Court when I was there in 2013 and knocked on the door and said, hi, I'm Kathleen Aldworth Foster. I'm researching the Aldworth family. And they said, well, we're in the middle of collecting all these pedigrees, come on in. So there I, there I was brought into this room and all the pedigrees were there. So that's where they helped me finally confirm I was in no way a direct descendant of theirs. They checked all the bastard children too. I am no way a direct descendant. <laughs> I'm just a very, very distant relative, which one of those little clues that my great grandmother gave me will come into play in confirming that. So we know that she. they also had another daughter named Mary who died young. Then they had a son named Boyle and he's the one that inherited uh, Newmarket Court. Then they had a son named St. Ledger Albert. And this is interesting because all of her brothers died. One of them, John, the one that I gave hemophilia in the book, which is partially true based on uh, legend. I was going to ask about that, too. (laughs) Yeah, uh, yeah, you get into the whole um, landlord rights issue where it was known that these landlords would rape Irish brides the night before their wedding. And that happened to a local family and the local family from there on had hemophilia. So that's where that whole story came into play but that brother john was actually really shot and killed in a duel so 
another little bit of story I can get to this. We've been uh, hearing a lot about duels uh, lately, huh, Wes? <laughs> really? Yeah, uh, we interviewed um, uh, another brother, Kyle. He wrote a book about Freemasonry in the wild, wild west. And there are uh, so many wild stories of duels and crazy stuff in there. That's cool. Well, yeah, well, that. yeah, because we, yeah, that book. <laughs> yeah, uh, we have been a lot of duels. And I was just looking up who was it? Um, another duel. I can't remember right now. That Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah, there's a couple. <laughs> There's at least another challenge to a duel in my book, which you probably saw. So when her brothers all died, her son, St. Ledger, her second son, they created the Viscount title for him. So he's the first Viscount, second creation. And he had to change his name to St. Ledger, St. Ledger. So this is one of the pedigrees that was there that day. And all of that text at the bottom is all the investigation into various bastards who did get the Aldworth name, but I am not one of them. But let's talk about what I did find out about the Aldworth family in the course of all of this um, fascinating research. So they were an ancient family from Britain. They um, originated in England in the Wantage or Bristol area. There's also a town called Aldworth there. They were merchant ship owners from Bristol, which means that they were probably likely slavers. And from what I saw in some of those historical society documents, that was unfortunately true. And Robert Aldworth, who um was uh who a little what was he a little bit older than Elizabeth and uh Richard and like the two generations above uh he was the first to bring refined sugar to England so if you go to Bristol and go to the church where he is he is buried with his wife there are loaves of sugar in the carvings in the cathedral where he's buried so they spent a lot of time in the West Indies and in India. The, the Aldworth family was the first to actually build a home in India uh, and, of course, the United States. So that same Robert Aldworth had an apprentice named Giles Elbridge, and they were the first patent landowners in, this, in what is now the state of Maine. It was all Massachusetts at the time, but they settled, uh, they made a fishing settlement in 1603, which is now, it's called, it was called Pemaquid, it's now Bristol, Maine. They also owned a ship called the Speedwell and the S Speedwell, I'm trying to confirm if their ship called the Speedwell is the same as the, S the Speedwell that left with the Mayflower and it sprung quite a few leaks, so many leaks that they think it may have been sabotaged, but everyone was taken off the Speedwell and put onto the Mayflower and that's why the Mayflower sailed alone. Oh. Meantime, at the same time, more Puritan settlers were leaving England and they were settling in Ireland. And that's where my branch of the family comes in. So I'm of the poorer Aldworth family. And they settled in a town called Bandon in 1620. But so these pedigrees are fascinating because you can see um, there are a few overlapping people. My people are over here on the left. There's a John and I still have a few uh, blanks to fill in there, but you can see Mr. Richard Aldworth and you can see the Lady Freemason on there, the Honorable Elizabeth St. Ledger. You, uh, it's down the bottom right. And you can see her family. Okay. And you can see the, yeah, I see a couple Richards uh, up top. Yeah, look uh, right in the middle. That would have been his dad or his grandfather, actually. His dad was Boyle. Oh, okay, all right. Who died um, on a on a crossing between england and ireland so when richard was very young yeah this is probably all like hieroglyphs to you right brock can't read uh because um... <laughs> <laughs> i remember i, I remember cursive? at lodge you're yeah. like i can't read this wes read this it, it was like um a lodge book from like 1907 or something it was it was yeah yeah it was and the handwriting is so swirly and elaborate dips in and out i'm like what letter is it? It's all a um italicized. I'm like, what italicized? Who oh did God. this? I'm like, I went, this is crazy. I went to Catholic school, so you know, I, I this is no problem. I was like, me. man, somebody's hands tilted at a 20 degree angle as they write the whole. I'm like, this is intense. <laughs> if you're right handed, it's a little harder when you're left handed. Yeah, it was it was absolutely amazing. Yeah, that is a true story that did happen at our lodge. <laughs> Well, so everything's going to make sense in a few minutes. So this is the portrait that um, one of her descendants, Ben Stocks in England, gave to me. 
So this is was actually one of the portraits of her that we know was painted from life. Oh, wow. And same with Richard in his powdered wig. And what do you guys think of the stance with the hand in the jacket? Got the hidden hand. Yeah. Bird. See, a lot of people say that's, oh, that's absolutely the Freemason stance. A lot of other people are like, that's eh, just what they did at the time. I don't know. Maybe the artist was just really bad at painting hands. <laughs> I uh, you'll nor normally sometimes you'll see within the um the second hand if it's tilted you'll see the fingers like this mm -hmm. and if you'll see like uh you'll see a, a certain thing which I kind of thought it was by the pinky but then I'm like eh, I don't yeah, know that's interesting I'll have to look at that yeah, yeah you'll see all kinds see, of yeah. different stuff like that yeah, usually usually it's like oh one hand is making an m like uh the the christos statue uh yeah jesus is just they say merovid one of his hands they say have an m i'm just all like, yeah, I, I i don't i don't know as a former artist if i couldn't draw something i'd probably cover it up <laughs> yeah, and I, then there's this this is the the famous oil painting of her it was absolutely not painted during her life it was painted af long after she died but it is currently, there's different versions of it, but this one is is hanging in the um, Freemasons Hall in Cork. Yeah, very small apron. Usually uh, they paint them really big, uh, at least on the men, so. Well, her, her real one, I'm gonna show you, is much larger. Okay. So then we've got all these various accounts. We've got Arundel Hill, his son testified that his father attended lodge alongside Elizabeth. She was, there's accounts that she was the master of her own lodge. Um, this is interesting. There's a letter from the Grand Mistress of, of Female Freemasons from 1767 that was, that's been attributed to Jonathan Swift. If you read it, there's all sorts of different uh, symbolism in it, including the beehive is mentioned in it. Uh, so I hope to work that into future books as something that she may, be, may have written. She hmm. led uh, Masonic processions. She was known to ride in an open carriage to theater in Dublin. And this is one of the things I was, I have to look this up as well. There's very few copies of it around anymore, but she was the second subscriber on Destiny's serious and impartial inquiry into the fate, the current state of Freemasonry's decline in Ireland is what it was called in 1744. Oh, and then there's this chair. So <clears throat> the, there's a, this is a chair that was donated to um, the Cork uh, Freemasons Hall and there's a plaque on it that says it was from 1718 and that it was used at her initiation. Uh, the chances of that are very very unlikely uh, but if it was at all used by her it would have been used in a later part of her life. So this is the, still the trip from 1713. This is David Butler the the guy who proofread my book and this is these are some of the things that they have from her life. Uh, that apron Get to the apron. All right, so you can see that it's actually it's 24, wait, 24 inches wide, 28 inches long. It was donated by a member of the Aldworth family. And you can see the light blue trim there. It's made of lamb's skin, but it may be a reproduction. Nobody really knows for sure. Now, um, it's treated like it was her stuff. From the way I'm looking at it, is that, um, is is the flap up the flaps up and the belt okay. yeah, that's what i was thinking as well yeah because yeah. i can't i can't really tell i'm probably should put my glasses on i don't see it i don't see a crease or anything so and it's just i think it's just been in there for so long and they're they are working on it too there's more restoration being done now and this is a miniature of her that is also supposedly done from life you see the little trial print pendant at what age would that have been i don't know maybe 50s she she lived a long life she lived to be 80 which is super unusual for that time <laughs> this is the jewel that we don't really talk about anymore because it's pretty much been debunked some people think it was it belonged to her but the the freemasons really don't think it, it did now this is how i saw this letter the first time i saw it and it was really folded in four pieces it was folded in it folded to just show really her signature but it has since been uh, restored. And I'm gonna show that to you at the end. She is buried in um, St. Finbar's Cathedral. Uh, 
And this is interesting because she had a full Masonic funeral in 1775. Now there's more dates on that plaque that's in the cathedral. Um, I, I went with the 1695, 1775, but that lodge number 44 couldn't possibly be true because there were no warrants in 1712. Maybe perhaps at one point, but the, that number 44 has been passed around a few times since. Yeah, from my understanding, uh, the numbers didn't come in uh, to existence until about 1717. Um, uh, speaking with Christopher Earnshaw, he, mm -hmm. from what I remember him saying, he couldn't find anything with numbers. That's a later thing put in yeah. by our time. So. Especially a number that high. Yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> and you had to be privy of it. it. It wasn't out in the open before 1717. Right. Well, I mean, and if you look at like the, the there's the Franken manuscript and there's other stuff that go back farther into the 1600s of Masons. There's Masonic references. There's talking of uh, all these other lodges that were meeting. And the formation was to unify all these different grand lot or these different lodges, pretty much fighting and biting over each other's turf and area. Uh, what the degree work was like, what the structure, and to unify all that and kind of bring it all under one Grand Lodge is kind of the formation of all that, I think, of uh, the United Grand Lodge of England. Have you heard of the, the Ball Bridge, B-A-A-L, B-A-A-L Bridge Square? It's also from Ireland, and it was a, a brass square, and I can't remember what's inscribed on it, but it might, you know, something about I'll have to look it up. I don't want to say anything incorrect, um, but it's from the 1500s. Wow. And you can buy a reproduction of it on the on a website. I don't remember which uh, which one. I'll find out. So this is what Saint Finbar's looks like today. But after she was buried in it, they knocked down the previous cathedral to build what it looks like today. And right around the time when that was happening, uh, this. Uh, they they opened her they opened her coffin and this is what they found, so the honorable Mrs. Aldworth was buried in the Dave, Davies vault, which is her vault, which is her cousin's, uh, beneath the late cathedral. The writer had an opportunity of seeing her remains a few years before the cathedral was taken down. She was then in a leaden shell and in a wonderful state of preservation. She was attired in a dark silk dress, white satin shoes, and silk stockings of a similar color. Her person was comely. Her face was a dust or ash color, her features quite perfect and calm. She had long silk gloves, which extended above the embroidered lace wristbands. She wore a white headdress with a frill around her neck, the plates of which were not even ruffled. The stone slab which covered the vault having become undecipherable with age was moved. Okay, so she was perfectly preserved. If, if she was a Catholic, we would have been calling her a saint. She's yeah, saint. probably, yeah. Right? Very like hermetically original. sealed in there. <laughs> this just had a very good vault. <laughs> so this is kind of what the light, the writing process looked like. That I was staying at a B and B across the street from where Donnerell Court is, and I just uh, made a mess as I was writing. But it was um, not an easy process. The whole writing process for me, I, I was wondering why me, why I was doing this, why I was compelled to do this. The fact that I wasn't Irish and I wasn't a direct descendant of hers, I kept having the, the thoughts, um, this is not your book to write. This is not your book to write. But something else was telling me, yes, this is your book to write. And I had to follow these voices in my head. They were really hollering at me until I actually, until I wrote the last chapter. They didn't quiet down until I wrote the last chapter. They were gone during the entire editing process, but it was loud and it forced me to finish it. I really can't explain why I did this. Pure mystery, but yeah. It's 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 pretty cool. But so let's get back to that clue that my great grandmother gave me back when I was a kid, and that is the and Aldworth signed the Declaration of Independence. Well, it turns out uh, one night in the writing of this book, I woke up at three o'clock in the morning and I thought, what did she mean? What did she mean? She had to have meant something by this. Now I'd searched the, on the internet, I'd searched everywhere. I couldn't find anything. And finally that night at 3 a.m., I punched in the right combination and I found Elbridge Jerry, who was governor of Massachusetts, the unfortunate namesake of gerrymandering. It's actually pronounced Gary, but everyone says Jerry. He was vice president under James Madison. And he, <laughs> some people say he was a Freemason. Some people say he was not, but he was definitely an Aldworth. Turns out, 
that guy G Giles Elbridge that I told you about, the, yeah. the uh, apprentice of Robert. Well, he married Robert's niece Elizabeth, and he was the sixth. She was his six times great grandmother. So, and Ald and Aldworth did indeed sign the Declaration of Independence. Oh wow! Yeah, isn't that crazy? Yeah. And I know that those two are related. His, his name, hold on. So I had to find more proof. So I went to the New York, New York Public Library. I pulled this book and I found the Aldworth Elbridge pedigree. And here we have Vice President Elbridge, the signer. And then up at the top, um, is it on this one or is it on this one? Uh, we've got Giles Elbridge, who was also on, if you remember, on the Lady Freemason and Richards pedigrees too. So they are directly related and they are also contemporaries. He was a bit younger than them, but it could make for very interesting reading in a fourth book when uh, at the dawning of the American Revolution, if they had anything to do with the spreading of Freemasonry to America. So I very could have. Wow. The things you the things you find, it's I know it just history is right, definitely stranger than fiction. I'm like, oh, my goodness, this just is wild. Yeah, so that little old lady knew what she was talking about. Let me see if I, um, there's the book. I wanted to show you guys this. I found this on eBay too. You see her at the bottom? I have yeah. a post. Okay, yeah. and there's George Washington. Jefferson, who was not a Freemason, but he's on it. Adams, who was a Freemason, even though his son was one of the biggest anti-Masons, right? Known in history. Andrew Jackson, who was a Freemason, Lafayette, who was a Freemason, and Mrs. Aldworth. I think this is from about the 1860s. I mean, it looks very similar to some uh, some uh, Masonic posters that are done in the same style with yeah, a number of uh, presidents that were Freemasons. But why her? Yeah. So, yeah. So she was known for quite a while. And except... Oh, yeah. Be um, like I was talking about about uh, Madame Blavatsky, uh, Annie Besant, um, Alice Bailey. All these people held her in extreme high regard, and they really, uh, you know, wanted to follow in her footsteps in making co masonry and women's Freemasonry and all this. That was one of their biggest things. Was uh, and you know, and that brought in the, like a lot of women's rights movements with those guys in England and Britain at the time. So. Uh, the things that they were doing it definitely uh, changed the world for, for the better, for sure. There's an independent lodge of women in uh, Brazil, in Brasilia, Brazil, and it's named after her. I, I spoke with them a few months ago. Brazil Freemasonry is just blowing up from what I hear. Man, that's like, cool. Man, it is just wild. They're very, they're very spiritual. So that's that's David Shires. He is the, the graphic designer and a Freemason uh, in Ireland. So he's the one who designed the cover and the interior too. And it was his brilliant idea to um, put in some cipher. Did you notice that there's a, a cipher code to decode in the book? Absolutely, we definitely did. You did it? Yeah, yeah, I did we, it. yeah we talked about it. Yeah. Although I think I screwed it up because whenever I, I put it <laughs> in the grid, I'm like two letters off. I did it across and down. I'm like, I did something wrong. I don't uh, know. It's, it, there's one misspelling in it because he's he does British spelling and I and I do English spelling, so there might be that might be what's confusing you. Okay. Um, but right. it was his idea and it turned out to be the biggest P I T A at the end. <laughs> but we had to keep <laughs> going. And I'm so glad we did. So and so it solves a um a tertiary, completely fictional mystery, but it absolves the Freemasons of something. So this is all from the um the book signing and the presentation in, at Freemasons Hall in Cork uh, last weekend. So that's, cool. that's the it's the their, it's their junior warden's chair, but that's the the chair that was believed to be used by Elizabeth at some point in her life, and it's been completely restored. It's beautiful. Well, for this show, that's the most important chair. <laughs> oh, who's yeah, because being at refreshment, there's a ritual for the junior warden when we go to refreshment. So that's uh. And everything I put on the memes, there's usually a junior warden's collar and a column. So that yeah, it works perfect. That's funny. Well, there you go. This woman standing in the middle is Mary St. Ledger. She is the sixth great granddaughter of Elizabeth and Richard. Oh. So she she came to all of the events. It was a gorgeous room. Whoa. That's 
me and David, two partners in crime. Now this is Don Royal Court. This is the entrance to the town. And uh, this is uh, Myra Ryall. She is um, she's a, a guide. She sh shows people around and she's very involved in local tourism. That's me and my, my husband and my twin daughters. And a woman stopped me to sign the book of my way in. And then here we are in the library. As you see, the walls are still green, but freshly painted. And I did a reading from chapter 18. Then we all moved into the lodge room. You can see this is what it looks like today. It's gorgeous. The renovation of the first and second floor is just absolutely beautiful. Yeah, it looks amazing. Yeah, it's really it was really emotional for me to see. <laughs> yeah. And then David, you saw that the the signature of mm -hmm. Elizabeth previously. He had it completely uh, restored. They, it was being held in place with those brass tacks, with the tacks removed. He had the paper restored and he read the whole letter to us for the first time and I got to hold it. And it was uh, a letter written on behalf of one of Elizabeth's servants and she was asking her cousin to vouch for this servant on a journey to make a payment. Some sort. Wow. How long did it take to restore that? I don't know. I can ask him. Uh, it's from 1751. The letter. I can't believe the restoration of the house. It's just so impressive to see it and then see it like that. And then to see the picture yeah. that you showed before, I'm like, that is just incredible. Yeah. And there she is. That's her portrait up there. Yeah. What a way to restore it back, to put the history to it and to let everybody learn from it. That is just amazing. Yeah. They get a lot of tourists going there. And uh, so, 600,000 people a year go through that park. Oh. It's a wildlife preserve as well. So you oh, can go on the tour or just hang out in the park. The park is extremely popular. Uh, and the, the the house has been closed to the public for the better part of the last two years. So it's just now reopening with the tours of the second floor for the first time this this month, that March 31st, it reopened. So just one question, as you did all the family history, did you come across any Freemasons in your own lineage? No, or? I didn't. No, oh, my wow. family uh, became Catholic not long after they moved to Philadelphia. And, you know, the Catholics are pretty anti. Yeah, it's a little frowned upon. <laughs> yeah, it's so funny, though, because whenever I talk to Catholics about it, I'm like, you know, it was the Pope that said that the Catholics can't be Freemasons. It's not that the Freemasons are saying that the Catholics can't be Freemasons. You know yeah, I mean? and it, it's in the fraternity, at least here in Illinois, most members are Catholic. That's funny, really. There are a lot. Yeah. 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 I mean, uh, a number of guys like, oh, yeah, whatever. I don't care. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but okay. I showed you my Canaan, my Canaan great grandfather after I did a presentation like this for the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania. But one of my cousins that, who I don't even know came out of the woodwork and said, wait, that's my great grandfather too. That's my. <laughs> yeah. So, and he had just become a Mason 18 months ago. Oh, nice. That's nice. probably cool to be here. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Um, yeah. Amazing. I, I have to ask, has your husband been interested in Freemasonry? No, not so far, but I bet my, <laughs> I bet my dad gets sucked in. <laughs> oh, that's, <funny. laughs> that, that's great. So how did he feel about you uh, writing this book? My, my husband or? My yeah, husband? your husband. Well, and, and your father, since extremely you supportive. I mean, for the first, you know, ten years or so that I was writing it, I I tried to get a publisher. I couldn't imagine why anyone wouldn't want to publish this. And finally, it was my husband who said, you know, self publishing is not as tab taboo as it used to be. Just do it yourself. Just complete this. And I did. I got all of the help I needed. I hired editors. I hired proofreaders. Uh, a, a woman who lives in Donnerill read every stinky version of my manuscript that I had over the course of 10 years. David Butler kept me from making stupid mistakes. And then I, yeah, I paid a lot of money to get it into the shape that it is in now. Before Excellent. It's a, it's a great book. I, I was smiling yeah. all the way through it. And, uh, and when it comes to the end, I, I, just because how Freemasonry is today and with us when her father or brothers, well, let's just kill her. I'm, I'm laughing. I'm sorry. I was laughing. It may have been really serious back then, but from what I know, I'm just like, Oh my, they were just trying to scare the shit out of her. I mean, well, that's kind of, that's exactly what I thought too. Just the allegory of Freemasonry is meant to like, kind of give you that little bit of startling to, to make it realer. So 
for them to be like, well, there is no other option here. You're either going to do this. And if she was terrified that she left, she's, she's not going to want to take part in it, you know? So then to be like, well, death is the only other option is pretty funny. And, you know, if it was her own family, even to be like, well, obviously they're not going to kill her, you know, a uh, family becomes, you know, before your lodge is kind of a thing we always talk about in Freemasonry. So uh, it's kind of funny to think of like, how tongue in cheek was that? How how scared was she that they were playing it up? Or like, how much did they want her not to release the secrets? Because, you know, it wasn't like the internet or books, you know, uh, she could have actually spoiled some secrets to people back then or, um, you know, who knows? Well, that's why I love the character of Richard, because depending upon your point of view, if you're just into historical fiction, he's the love interest. But if you're a Freemason, he's like the guiding light, right? He's the he's the guy who stands up and says, like, these are the virtues we need to follow. And then he's also he also makes himself her sponsor, right? When he says, you know, I'll be responsible for her. It's, it's not exactly romantic. I think he means it in a Masonic way. I'm going to show her the way. Yeah, I kind of I took it both ways too. I'm like, it was very interesting how how you wrote him. He seems to like you said the guiding light even from the beginning when she was being courted by these other guys. All right, it's time for her to go on and be a lady and be married. So, and he was yeah. the stand out one. So, and I also like him in terms of tourism too for the area because it's through him that you leave the walls of Don Earl Court. You get to see. You get to hear about his house through the tinker. You get to go with the uh, her father, Lord Donnerell, and and pick up the the rent from other people. And you run into Richard there. So he he plays a lot of roles for the different uh, readers of this book. I was just very fascinated and blown away by your book. And like you said earlier, you're like, uh, you know, maybe I shouldn't put that in, but you put it in anyways, and people are reading it. I'm just like, well, how did she get away with all this? Because I I, I'm just like, it's amazing. And but when you said, you know, you had other Masons look over it and they're like, okay, this is good. Yeah, I, no, I, I mean, wow. they, they let a lot go because it's already out there. They never gave me anything. They kept right. saying, I can't give you anything, but I can tell you it's out there for you to find. So I went out there, I found what I found, and I really thought I was making it di as different, uh, different enough, considering, mm -hmm. you know, couldn't possibly have looked exactly as it did today in 1712 right. yeah. but um yeah you know you're not going to please everyone no 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 you're not but i i'm very well pleased with the book it, it was great and I, anybody that would listen i'm telling them like oh have you heard of the first lady freemason i know <laughs> you have you gotta read this book here let me send it to you so it, it was just very very fun read i'm not really big on reading fiction i usually just want to watch it and get it over with but when you said historical fiction i'm like okay that sounds even better let's check it out and for me this is probably how the sh story should be presented by every mason because it's fascinating yeah. yeah and i really tried hard to figure out what the most uh, feasible story could be there was a uh, let's see one thing oh the prayer uh well okay when they open lodge it's pretty much the same thing how we, i'm like it's very close um did you use the irish ritual or did oh, you yes. make some of it up irish ritual i used the, the the monitor essentially from ireland and there are did you notice a few differences between what you do and what they do oh yeah yeah oh yeah especially with the where how they wear their apron i may have overlooked that yeah, uh, i didn't notice that they wear it under their waist. And, and, uh, is it under? Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 Instead of some, on top. Of, yeah. yeah. Here in America, some of them are, are different. Well, uh, I was going to say, some places that's cool and you can do that. Some places that better be over top of your suit coat. <laughs> it looks yeah. so uncomfortable. Isn't it uncomfortable? It when is. you're sitting, it is. It's kind of <laughs> odd, but it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. So they only wear it inside. Yeah. Very, very interesting. Yeah, I remember uh, I asked about that. If from like here in Illinois, we wear it outside. If we travel to another jurisdiction and they wear it under their coat, do we wear it that way? Absolutely not. You were raised in this jurisdiction. That's how you wear it. Okay. <laughs> I'm not trying to go over the line, but yeah, 
that, yeah. that, that was that was neat um when it comes to the lodge building inside Donnerail court was that typical for lodges to meet at at homes because for everything i know it was uh it was at bars and in 1717 that's when they start recording the these taverns at of these events at bars right and even in massachusetts too around the same time but mm -hmm. in ireland that this is the only proof i've found very neat i you know i had a whole bunch of questions and you pretty much answered uh, all i was gonna say yeah a lot of them the like, questions we pre-had are already answered so yeah yeah um well i have a lot more research i gave you guys the shortened version because i didn't know how much time we have but that presentation it, uh, was yeah. awesome yeah it, it it was it was really cool to go through that and see all that that's yeah. a lot okay. of information to take in uh chapter 14 page 79 the Jeez. <laughs> Mar Marin, I think it is. Sorry, I oh, and I just wrote it down so I wouldn't. Yes, forget. that's a cool, right? Yeah, is that that's a real yeah. thing? Is that an Irish? Yes, it, that and that actual stone did exist and was found nearby. So I worked that in, and they. Yeah. I mean, the Irish have so many fascinating. Uh, beliefs and legends and folklore and that really was one of them you know it, it cured a, the cattle it can cure her it was funny yeah me and Wes were talking about that yeah yeah, yeah Brock asked me yesterday he's like what the heck is this stone in Ricketts I'm like well it has nothing, <laughs> it has nothing to do with the Cubs ownership so I know that so no I just I just scoured online um there's uh um online there's something i don't know how to pronounce it there's d-u-c-h-a-s dot i-e and it's a series of uh handwritten accounts uh about different folklore from all across the the state of ireland the country of ireland and that's one of the places where i found a lot of these little tidbits and, and i take it you added that into the character of rihanna her um which part the her well witchcraft the or rituals or in the ring and all that so the ring really was that that clotter ring that famous clotter ring was really was designed and created by an irishman in the west indies who then brought it back to ireland oh wow yeah i mean i i know the clotter ring but the way right. it was described i'm like opening i've never seen one open. now that i found one i have one now there is one that's a, a poison ring i found one on online uh -huh. But yeah, they're generally not like that. Hers was because I needed her to become a, a witch and with a spell. <laughs> yeah, it was a nice little twist of the story. I wasn't expecting it, but yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, everybody has their oh, we'll do this love potion so he falls in love with me or she falls in love with me. I mean, we've all heard that as kids, so right. And the ghost stories, all the ghost yeah. stories in there are all true ghost stories from the area. Oh, really? Awesome. Mm -hmm. Oh, nice. That. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I'm even more fascinated with, with the book now. <laughs> and the and the tree, the 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 the, the fairy tree. That yeah, is that was. Just we had that on our that. questions too. Yeah, the, <laughs> oh, and the, and the, that lesson in knitting was really a real lesson in knitting that I received from my husband's aunt. <laughs> so I wrote that whole thing and didn't tell her it was in there. She read the book and was like, "Oh no, that's us." Yes, it was. But oh, that's the, very cool. That whole because I was going to ask that they have to do with like uh, Masonic perfection. Okay, nope, you screwed up. You got to go and well, kind of right. It's an yeah. it's yeah. another lesson that she was learning from her her mother. I mean, her mother really wanted to set her straight. She was kind of a, a pain in the butt. This girl until she, <laughs> she had a real growing up moment overnight, right? But that, and, that tree the, with the booties, that's that's another tradition. And then there's a true story in, that didn't happen all that long ago. Uh, there was a fairy tree uh, near the, the road leading from the Shannon Airport, and they wanted to knock it down in order to build this new road, but they ended up building the road around this fairy tree. Oh, wow. This was only like in the early 2000s yeah i was gonna say fairies still are like pretty common in there when you hear like cryptid stuff or like weird stuff on tiktok you'll see like people are always claiming to see fairies or like all this weird stuff is still coming out of ireland so like yeah. it's still pretty funny that like this stuff still happens today or like it's still pretty common yeah and then the banshee and the o names that's oh the yeah yeah yeah, everything. I just went around. I talked to a bunch of people. I collected all these stories, and then I just wove them all in. Well, the people in Freemason who are going to read that, they're the kind of people who have a little bit of knowledge about that, who want to hear about it and let their mind kind of swirl in it. So 
the hit enough history enough enough fiction enough uh you know it just blends it perfect the interest in Freemasonry from Freemasons surprised me. I was really writing this book for myself. I went to Donorail. I would have bought this book back in 2006, the first trip I made. Their book, This book didn't exist. So I wrote it basically for myself. I wrote the book I wanted to read. I had interest in Freemasonry. I put enough in, in it, I thought, to kind of satisfy that minimal interest. But the writer or the reader that I had in mind when I wrote this book was more of a tourist like me and people interested in historical fiction i'm thrilled that the freemasons are interested because then yeah, I, was, I get to share my real research wes where did you found the book online first correct i think i was where just you flipping find it through originally? uh flipping through facebook yeah and, and you seen a post or something with yeah it? somebody posted this there was uh uh your book and somebody else's they, they were fairly new at least to me i'm like oh okay let's check it out and then i'm like wow wait a minute all right let's check it out i because like you said no one wrote a book about this before or, you know it's just told from uh mouth to ear pretty much and that's it there's nothing there's really nothing else that i knew of or that i got information from anybody else right a chapter here and there like in karen kidd's book and then the the memoirs that the the freemasons have been putting out but other than that, no, there's nothing like this. Nothing that really brings the story to life in this kind of way. So I did it. Right. I still can't believe it. Believe me, I can't. I can't believe it. <laughs> now, um, you did mention co-masonry and there's, uh, you know, other female Grand Lodges out there, whether recognized or not. How have they received this book? So well, so well, lots of interest. I haven't talked to the women in England yet. There's a HFAF, right? I haven't spoken to them. But I'm yeah, thinking. they're, uh, they're well, I don't know the exact term. They're like recognized. We know they're there, but they're not officially part of the UGLE. So right. yeah, there's a lot of that. Same with the group in, in Brazil. They're independent. They're not recognized, but they use the same facilities. And I'm surprised how many Freemasons, I, I thought that there would be a lot of anger considering this brings up the whole women, should we, should women be Freemasons or not? Uh, but I found actually the opposite. I found a lot of men who believe that they should be allowed in in order to keep the craft going, in, in order to bring in more members. Of the, and, and older men too, older men who've watched it, watched the numbers decline, just want to see it survive. Yeah, I don't, now I don't see a problem with it. I'm kind of like, could it be like Prince Hall where, where everybody's recognized, uh, affiliated, you can visit if you want. We still say stay separate. I'm, I know it's different wherever you go, but it's like, we're not really, maybe we don't want to subject you to the silly stated meetings. We're just, because they're yeah. just business meetings. <laughs> There's yeah. really nothing secret to it, but you know, it why not? Change, why? It would change the flavor, I think. I don't really have a horse in this race. I um, I know there's plenty of things that I would prefer to do just with my girlfriend. So I'm cool with that. Yeah, I, I mean pretty much that's that would be freemasonry right there without <laughs> right brock yeah so i've really enjoyed my time with freemasons though I, i've got quite a few events coming up um a couple in south jersey later this month and this yeah, you were, enthusiasm is really great yeah you were just on a book tour and i yeah a couple of weeks ago so how yeah, did it, was last week. it was just last week. Week. <laughs> yeah okay. i just got back it was the the fourteenth and fifteenth were the big events. Okay, um, the Freemasons Hall in Cork, one other bookstore and a cafe. Two bookstores, um, yeah, and then well, the cafe was supposed to be my official book launch party, but the woman who's who owns the cafe, her mother died. Oh, oh no! We were supposed to go right from it was Myra. She still did the tour with Donna Rell Court, but we canceled the party because it just didn't seem right. All right. Oh, that's understandable. Yeah, yeah. So I still need to have a party. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're <good> at party. <laughs> yeah, we're we're definitely good at that. We'll uh, <laughs> we'll get in some trouble there. Um. So with all your research and everything you found out about Freemasonry and uh, uh, Elizabeth, if you had the chance to join Freemasonry and be recognized, would you do it? Not yet. Not until I'm done writing these books. 
I could never a great idea. <laughs> I could never ever write these books. If I came close, I I contacted the co-masons in New York a few years ago and I, I thought about it and I've and, heard them interviewed before and they are very cool and they have like a group in California and like how they're like a group of women from around the country who like almost fly together to have lodge me is just crazy. Like this was of, the co-masons. This was many. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's uh, who did uh, I think uh, the one of the other Masonic podcasts interviewed him, and it was it was very enlightening to listen to. That's you know that's probably why it's so well received in the Masonic community is we're all hungry for knowledge and researching stuff and uh, the history of behind it. But then, kind of like you're saying, um, with the way the worlds are changing and uh, Odd Fellows going into like co, and you know, you kind of think like with the numbers and will we ever do that? Will it, will it be like that? And uh, I, I mean, I have a daughter, so it's kind of like, makes me think like, well, that would be cool, but it isn't something I'm like pressing at the front of either, but. Yeah. yeah. There was a man in Maine who was helping me, an older man, and he was really for letting women in. And unfortunately he died right before I published. So he never got to see the final result. Did he get to, uh read uh, any of your manuscripts or anything oh. died kind of suddenly yeah but oh. he spent a lot of time on the phone he was really excited about it he was really supportive oh i uh, bet yeah but but i was surprised that he was interested in allowing women yeah it it comes up every now and then um we don't really talk about it on the show we just try to stay away from it. it's kind of kind of controversial with some of the people here in illinois and throughout the states so we're really just the fun group. Hey, this is Freemasonry. We're regular guys. Just come have a drink, whatever, and listen to us just BS. Yeah, well, the very notion of Elizabeth brings up the same. I mean, over the years, there's been plenty of men who are like, that never happened. This whole story is an exaggeration. <laughs> well, you know, believe what you want to believe. Dude. Yeah, it looks like there's a lot of facts to me here. So. <laughs> there's enough to prove that this uh, that she was a Freemason. Yeah. How yeah. it all happened, we would we may never know, but uh, no, we may not. But your your book is the closest thing to it, and I'm very grateful that you. I enjoyed it so much. I'm so glad. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, thank you for taking the time out to you know even come on here and talk to us about it and give us the presentation. And you know, I know our fans will love it, and hopefully, somebody comes out and buys the book. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, I just recently heard from. Um, masonic publisher in london we're kind of passing emails back and forth so i've thought about sometimes maybe doing that i don't know i, I don't know you know it make a great movie yeah great yeah movie. i could see it I, I could see this being a movie yeah and we were just talking to uh um kyle grafstorm about his book and like i could see this being a movie i could see this being a movie too yeah uh, kind of like uh the old uh 1940s black and white version i i would say that would work perfectly for that well, <laughs> when you mean, hear of the 1800s and stuff like a lot of people think oh, i was boring nothing was going on nobody had anything to do and it's like as the other way around there was so <laughs> much going on and so much it's just it's so crazy to think of how much history we don't know and and the house is still standing. The estate is still standing. I mean, you can go back and be in the very room where this whole thing took place. Anyone can, any tourist can. And that in itself is just amazing. I wouldn't even have known it was there if it weren't for your book. Ah, I well, mean, because to me, it was just, hey, it's a story. Whether it's true or yeah. not, I have no idea, but it's still pretty neat. I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to help the town of Donrail. I'm, I'm thrilled to help uh, the tourism industry in Cork County. It's all putting the attention on it. And I just love watching it happen. Great. Well, I know this is bringing us towards the end. What we like to do at the end is give our guests the opportunity to give a shout out and shots out to anybody you'd like. I probably should have put it in an email, but you know, I was putting you a little bit on the spot. But if there's anybody you want to uh, recognize, just shout out and you know, now's the time. The first thing that comes to my mind is really my now adoptive family in Ireland. The people that helped me and my family out the past few weeks, the people who have been helping me out since I started this research. I mean, the, the people of Ireland are just a very special group of people, and I just want to tell them all how much I love them. <laughs>
Oh, great. Thank you very much for coming on the show. I enjoyed meeting you and talking to you and Absolutely. learning more about this. It's been a wonderful experience. Again, I enjoyed your book so much. Is there any uh, preferred way you would like people to get the book? Yeah, if you're in the U.S., go to DonnaRealCourt.com. That's my website, and you can place an order through PayPal there, and I can sign a book and actually send it to you. Uh, otherwise, you know, any bookstore can order it. Get it on Amazon. It's available anywhere. Yeah, Find and it. it is on Barnes & Noble. I came across yeah. it. So. Yeah. Pretty yeah. neat. But Brock, if you sign got... it from me, I'll sign it. Yes, and you did sign. You did sign mine. I'm very grateful for that. It, oh, I don't have a signed copy. Well, oh, well, uh, I'll you one. oh, you'll have to order it. <laughs> <laughs> Brock, Glad you enjoyed it. Brock, do you have any closing remarks? Uh, just thank you so much for writing the book. Thank you for the awesome research, and um, you know, I hope everybody goes out and checks it out and looks it up because it is an amazing story. Great, I hope they do too. Yeah, uh, well. I'll just close this out real quick and stick around. So everyone, thank you for watching this episode. Uh, search the search for the book or we'll have links on it in our description. So again, everyone, thank you for watching. If you haven't figured it out, you're watching us on YouTube, Rumble, listening to us on iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and all that other fun stuff. So everyone, thank you again for watching, listening, and we will be back with more.